Welcome to Adventures in Life. I am Earl Beecher, your host. We have three special guests here, and I would like to be able to introduce them uh, one at a time. On my immediate right is Dr. George Demas, and Dr. Demas and I have been friends for well, 45 years, I think, and he is a frequent guest on the show to the point that he often serves as co-host. And I asked him uh, uh, about, he just went over to Thailand to see the devastation by the tsunami. tsunami. And he said, Earl, you've got to meet Dr. Colleen, Colleen Fitzpatrick and Dr. Andrew Yeiser. <laughs> I'll get it right. And, I have and trouble I said, with it too. All right, George, uh, we have Dr. Fitzpatrick and Dr. Yeiser here. What is it? that you brought them to my attention? I think that uh, they are going to play a very significant role in our return to the devastation of Thailand in particular in their work with DNA in particular. DNA? DNA, yes. Oh, you're on the cutting edge. Yeah, I guess we are. <laughs> I hear about it all the time on CSI, you know. Oh, some yeah. Some of the, yes. the TV shows. You bet. Are they accurate in their portrayals at all? Um, I'm afraid I don't have time to watch too much TV. Sorry. Oh, Earl. well, you just haven't retired. Except yet. for, <laughs> except, yeah, right, except for, except for your show on cable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. You're very kind, Colleen. Uh, Colleen has a brand new book out when you're talking about, I mean, brand new. Yeah, brand new last week. Uh, last week. And when you're talking about being busy, uh, give us the title of your book and, and the sort of what it deals with, please. Well, it's called Forensic Genealogy, and um, two of my favorite hobbies are genealogy and forensic science. And so, being a scientist, I just, in doing my genealogy, I just naturally came up with all kind of neat ways of researching history and family, and, and um, so I wrote a book about it, and um, of course it's got a large section on DNA testing, because for five years I've been conducting a Fitzpatrick DNA study of Fitzpatrick's all over the world, and so I use that as examples for that chapter and people that want to do similar studies. Have you been overseas in your studies? Yes, I have. I've been to Ireland mainly to do research over there. But I know Fitzpatrick's all over the place, and I just haven't had time to get to them all myself. Mainly it's been organized over the Internet. Over the Internet? Yep. Okay. And Dr. Yeiser, you've lived everywhere. Not Everywhere. Just I have it on places. good authority from Dr. Fitzpatrick. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell us some of the places you've been. Oh, Turkey, Iran, Egypt, India, Oman, uh, Malaysia, Guyana, Nigeria, uh, Mexico. And these uh, weren't just three-week vacations, were they? I, I worked in all of those countries. I, I toured a lot of other countries, but I worked in those countries. And were you connected with DNA or anything of that nature over there? No, I was primarily connected with computers and mostly assignments with the United Nations. You needed UNIDO and IAEA, International Atomic Energy. IAEA, International Atomic Energy. Energy. What's the last A? <laughs> Gone. <laughs> we have to be careful what Before we do with that atomic energy, or the, the whole population could be gone. My, <laughs> I went over to um, counsel them on reliability, and my wife pointed out what appeared to her to be an incentive program, my office was directly above the atomic reactor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, did that feel comfortable? No problem. You just didn't pay any attention. There was no leakage or radiation you had to worry about. Well, I got a full body scan occasionally. Well, once in a while. Yeah. Uh, I want to return to Dr. Demas. Um, you went over to Thailand. Yes. Tell us what you found. We went to Phuket, uh, which is the island where most of the, the, the uh, disaster occurred. The tsunami. Uh, this is the this, tsunami on yes, December the 26th. On December the 26th that uh, destroyed, was the most devastating 
uh, natural disaster they think of all time, and some 300,000 lives were lost. Were there 300,000? Yes, I, the I had heard 250, that's but the they're still finding more? They're still finding more bodies. Oh, dear. In uh, Thailand, it wasn't that bad. Of all the 12 countries, it was probably the least damaged. But uh, we were invited to go there. They're friends of the United States. They like us a lot. And uh, World Aid was there, and they invited uh, Chaplain Howe, who is commander of our unit, which is the United States Service Command, a disaster relief organization. Doctor? It was uh, Chaplain Howe. Chaplain Howe. Yeah, Joseph Howe. Joseph Howe. Yes, he's a clergyman who heads up our unit. And we have been in existence uh, approximately 15 years, and we had a chance to go back and help at 9-11. I went back myself a month after 9-11 and had a chance to work with some of the uh, people there with post-traumatic stress disorder. And that was my primary goal for going over to Phuket as well, to see what we could do to help. Did you find a lot of PTSD, post-traumatic stress yes. disorder? Or, or were the actual physical problems so overwhelming that you didn't get a chance to do much in the other? No, actually, uh, my goal was to determine what, how severe it was. And, of course, the devastation was absolutely unbelievable. These people had no warning, did they? No, no warning whatsoever. And this was one of the problems that, uh, interestingly enough, one of the meteorologists from uh, Thailand five years ago indicated that they should do something about a tsunami. And he was laughed off the face of the earth, practically. They said, tsunami, what's that? You know, He said, well, this is a very dangerous thing that could happen right here. We have no warning system in the Indian Ocean. And uh, the Pacific Ocean, the United States does, and countries in the Pacific, but not the Indian. Well, at any rate, they, uh, they said no, they wouldn't do it, and uh, because they were fearful of it, its effect on tourism. And uh, this man was so You correct. know, I saw the same theme in Jaws. We don't let anybody know there's a danger out there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, that's in the exactly, movie. That's exactly what happened. And uh, now this man, this man was fired from his job for, for talking about uh, putting some preventive measures into action. Some warning signals. Warning systems. signals, which would be in the Indian Ocean, which would probably cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. Oh, had yeah. They, had they had those... It would have prevented the deaths of many hundreds of thousands or millions of people, or hundreds of thousands of people, yeah. at least. And uh, so at any rate, this was our concern, and uh, the devastation was unbelievable, and we show some pictures of it. it as I said... You it, did bring some pictures, I did bring which some we pictures, will which, insert. Yes, uh, well, you can see some of it. It's a 50-foot wave that hit the beach, going at about 50 to 100 miles an hour, that traveled inland for about one mile. So you can imagine, and the surge that came back with the wave was also just as devastating. You mean coming in, it did damage, and then going and back, going out, back out, out, it did damage. It did, damage. did a second one come in? Yes, a, a disastrous second wave came in in the afternoon. Uh, the first wave came in in Thailand, in Phuket, at uh, 9.50 uh, a.m. and uh, on a Sunday. That afternoon, at 3.30, a second giant wave came. Oh, they were six hours apart. Six hours, yes. I had no clue on yes, that. Yes. I thought it would be one wave and then the next yes. wave. No, what happened was it came later. And uh, there were some waves that came after the first one. Yeah. But the giant one that, uh, that uh, followed up came later. And, of course, this took many lives, too, because people... They you thought know, it was over. They thought it was over, and oh. they didn't have an adequate warning system to keep people out. They tried to get the police and army to keep people out, but naturally the attraction was to go to the beach. Go and look and see go what's look happened. Go and see what's happened, and of course this other wave came and got Which one more. did more damage? The first one. The first one. The first one definitely did more damage. It was the most devastating one of all. And as I said, when you picture a wave, just visualize a four-story building and a wave traveling at that height. We saw the height of it <coughs> and traveling at a speed of 50 to 100 miles an hour when it hits the land. It's traveling in the ocean at 500 miles an hour or so, but when it hits the land, it moves up. It gets into shallow water oh, and, it, yeah, and it, comes, it, piles it piles up, up and raises up, and uh, this is what caused such great damage. 
And of course, you can't outrun a tsunami, you can't outswim it, you not can't at 50 surf it, miles an hour. not at that speed. So it was uh, virtually everybody was, was, was killed that was in its path. Now, it wasn't the whole 75 miles. There were certain areas that weren't hit as hard as others. The 75 miles of, that we traveled through in the island of Phuket, but uh, certain areas were hit harder than others, and there were certain natural scenes that d it depended on the, the terrain more than anything that protected some coves and so forth. But generally, the entire coast was very much devastated. Now, you said almost everyone was killed. Did you find a lot of wounded people there? We found a lot of people who were psychologically wounded with post-traumatic stress disorder. And that is my specialty, and that's what I, I wanted to help with. And that's what I, I did. And our team did work with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I was going to ask you yeah. about the mission of your team, yes. what you were doing. Our mission was, first of all, to determine what we could do to help, what was necessary. Was it necessary to bring food, medicines, and so forth? Of course, those are needed. But our specialty is dealing with the results of the trauma, the, the tragedy of, of stress. Uh, and, uh, well, losing loved ones. Losing loved families ones. Families broken up. And friends, relatives, and it just there wasn't a person that we talked to that didn't have some relative or friend or neighbor who was killed or who was missing. And, uh, and of course, had some experience to share with us which led to nightmares and cold sweats and depression and a host of other uh, symptoms that are characteristic of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, the thousand-yard stare, so to speak, there were a lot of people just stared in space and didn't respond and kept could reliving the experience. They were literally in shock. Yeah, in shock. And this was a month after the tsunami where we were there and they continued to feel this way. Mm -hmm. My word. Um, and it was very widespread. There were other problems related to it that led you to bring Dr. Fitzpatrick yes. and Dr. Yeiser here. Yes, we saw 3,000 caskets, primarily of Europeans, Northern Europeans, and uh, these caskets were being weighted for DNA testing. And I know that Dr. Fitzpatrick is an expert in this area, and I, we contacted her, and we want to bring her on our team when we go back because there was virtually no DNA testing for the natives. It was all done for Europeans, primarily because they could afford to get it done, and uh, this was the mission. In other words, you had all these dead bodies. You didn't know who they were? Yes, many of them. And you were trying to do DNA testing yes, to three, establish the yes, identity? 3,000 of European bodies and were in caskets. How did you know they were European? They could tell by their, by their appearance when they were, when they were found their skin color, their dress, dress their skin and color, so forth. I and, see. Uh, and sometimes they had uh, had some identification with them. But I think this is a good time to turn to Dr. Fitzpatrick. Yes, I'd like to. And to mm -hmm. Colleen and Andy and I'm going to ask talk. you to sort of spearhead the conversation <laughs> well, with them because <laughs> you're you're more their level than I am. Well, not really. You're a professor too. But I wanted to say that uh, Colleen is is really an expert in this, and it, it seems to me that we need to go back, and we're bringing her along with Andy, um, if we can get adequate funding to take us back to do more of the DNA testing for the native population. And specifically, we're interested in the orphans. Yes. And reuniting them with their families. Exactly. And a little work was done with Europeans in this area. Yes. One non-European that was widely publicized and nothing else that we know of. Yes. So we are hoping that we can make a, a difference yes, in this that, area. I'm sure you can. Incidentally, I saw hundreds and, of children, young children who are orphans who would uh, surround us and, and uh, grab us by our legs and hands and mm -hmm. want to be touched mm -hmm. and so forth, as did the adults. We did a lot of hugging over there. <laughs> yeah. It's really important because sometimes people come to claim the children and you don't know if it's the parents or not. Exactly. And there so, are predators at work. Yeah, there are predators and, you know, yes. other, just all kinds of things that can happen to the children yes. if they're not placed correctly. Exactly. And that's why it's so important for us to bring Andy and Colleen yeah. over with us to do well, this testing. What do you do? I mean, <coughs> so somebody's claiming the child. Um, well, basically, if the person, the idea right now, uh, 
what we eventually will do depends on the circumstances when we get there and see what the situation is and what the facilities are but basically all it requires is a swab from the inside of somebody's cheek and that's enough DNA to be tested by uh, there's a company in Salt Lake City that has donated all their services for all the testing we can imagine in one orphan up to thousands whatever we can bring in they will test what is the name of that company it's huh? called relative genetics it's a great company it's the one relative I, genetics yes it's it's a spin-off of a nonprofit organization called the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation and I believe they might be really the one sponsoring the DNA work on the orphans relative genetics is the commercial arm through which I do my Fitzpatrick study so when I talk to people I generally talk to the relative genetics people because I know them so well but it's probably sponsored by the Sorensen Foundation and they have a lot of studies going um, mapping population flows you know testing where people came from and finding out how they settled there and they had one case where they had some Indians in Costa Rica that were living uh, near the coast that had no much, much, not much history um, and they tested for example they tested Indians similar Indians in the mountains and they were made a genetic match so they were able to deduce that the Indians on the coast got there as slaves captured by the Spaniards and ra raised in the mountains and were brought to where the ships were coming in and then I, I hope I'm saying this right I could be corrected on some of the details of the story but they were able to reconstruct the Indians history back way beyond the Spanish mm -hmm. by connecting them with all the, the tribes in the mountains really way back into the yes, pre-Columbian right, age right re mm -hmm. reconstruct their whole tribes history to whenever really yeah and there's many other examples that uh, similar studies and similar results of their studies so they um, people they were doing um, some specific name studies for free for a while if it was an unusual name a very interesting name because of their other interest and it became so popular that they spun off relative genetics where people do single name studies there, there's that company there's a couple of other companies and I'd say altogether there's probably um, 2,500 single name studies going on but those studies include many other surnames so it's probably 10,000 or more surnames included somewhere in some study. Uh, I'm a little lost I kind of followed. <laughs> okay sorry uh, you asked me a question I'll tell you an answer. <laughs> okay the the single name studies you're talking about one family name yeah and then they can just trace it back yeah. to all the branches yeah but that would be like in in the case of uh, American genealogy they follow the, the male line yeah. because that's the name where that's the women right. their their family names get lost right it's, it that's studies the male the line chromosome. it studies the male line I'm studying all male Fitzpatrick's my brother was in the study for our family I see just the male chromosome this for the the orphans now returning to that it would be a slightly different study because there's a, a study uh, you can do paternity obviously people know that um, you can do um, also something called avuncular DNA testing where you can have an aunt or an uncle and have a it, it, they return a probability that that is the child's aunt or uncle or, or cousin. first cousin or sibling the DNA can reveal yeah. this yes. even though it's got a different surname um, yeah yeah so it's uh, through a the female member somewhere. right the surname study is one product that they offer and how I got into it but for the orphans they have many other ways to test to see if an orphan and a person claiming them is an aunt a half sibling a mother a father there's more kinds of testing that relate to the women and the men the mother and the father the aunt and the uncle other relatives it's a broader study well now this is this is what was crossing my mind you found there were problems there with predators abusing children yeah in what ways well you know you can see baby 81 is a very popular example of there were nine couples coming in to claim that child after the tsunami in Sri Lanka and, and it was only through DNA testing that they could determine which were the true parents and they pick up children to use as slaves in factories or sex slaves or recruit very young children into uh, armies um, insurgent armies uh, there is a lot of pred predating Predator. going on yeah. 
among children in this world, unfortunately. And the tsunami presented a wide open field for them. They come yeah. in and claim this must be my child. Are they coming Take from surrounding countries or from within the country itself? Or it's hard what? to tell without the DNA testing. I see. Yeah. Well, that was one of the reasons, George, when you mentioned you wanted to bring them in as part yes. of your team, what would they do? Well, just as they said, they would do a, a very, very important job in determining the parents of the true parents of these orphans. Who they are could determine if they're dead or alive. The family. They the could, family. A, a person they could find in. living relatives. Yes. 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 Right. That's right. the objective. That's, right. that's the objective. Right. I see. And we would, our team would work with the, the individuals who are continuing to have nightmares, to wake up in the middle of the night oh, yes. screaming and crying and so forth, refusing to go to the beach anymore, even though it was their chief form of recreation. Fearfulness, uh, just unbelievable. They can't turn off the fear. And uh, even though it's happened, it can, sometimes uh, many months and years ago, it can come back. It's a reoccurring kind of condition that can come back unless you treat it early through talk therapy. For instance, they're finding that the Marines who are coming back from Iraq, one out of four has PTSD. And one of the mm. things they're doing is they're working with them to talk out their fears and concerns and just talk out their problems. Can you really talk the fear away? You can't talk it away, but you can do a lot about it. There's, there's things you can do with, through, through reliving the experience, through what we call abreacting, that is a kind of play therapy, reliving it, acting it out, so to speak, with children it's play, with adults it's acting it out. Other times it's, uh, you can use other techniques, uh, such as hypnosis and medication. There's a host of other approaches. There's at least 10 or 15 distinct approaches that you can use to counteract this illness, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is very much more common than we think. It could occur in accidents, it could occur in injuries, severe injuries, it could occur in robbery, rape, any number of things, as well as combat situations. Anybody who's been subjected to a trauma, a, trauma, a traumatic yes. experience, oh. yes. or illness? Yes, an illness can do it too. A severe illness, right, can cause it. I, I want to reintroduce my guests in case somebody tuned in late. Dr. George Demas, Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, and Dr. Andrew Yeiser. Did I say it right? You did. <laughs> you got it. Right. 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 Great. Give you a and gold star. I want to mention this book again, Forensic Gene. Yeah. Why didn't you call it Relative uh, Genealogy? Or you've used that phrase several times. And I do want to talk oh, yeah, about George's this. George's mission, yeah. But tell me more about the book right now. Um, it's like forensic science. It's a big popular thing these days with CSI and medical detectives and forensic files. You know, they find a carpet fiber and they know the guy's third grade teacher's name. You know, and you see some... Yeah! <laughs> that's what I do with pictures and uh, just family trees and DNA. And I, I discovered a whole lot of ways that are real easy to do com some real fascinating re research. Just anybody can do and, it. And is this written at a level where even I can oh, understand absolutely. what you're talking about? <laughs> Don't worry, yeah. I just show people how to have fun with it. Yeah. Fun with it? Yeah. But what you're planning to do overseas is not for fun. No, no, no. it's for goodwill. No. This is deadly it's earnest. Good stuff. It's a humanitarian Yeah, yeah. humanitarian. is I, what it is. I did want to make a comment that as you get orphans back to their families, you're actually rebuilding the culture by getting family units back and villages yes. back. You yes. really are putting back into place what has been wiped out by the tsunami in a it's, cultural and historical sense. It's been disrupted sense. tremendously. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And this can work on more than orphans is what Collins yeah. is saying. Right. It's good for we the whole thing. We can get tribal and family units gathered back together again to reoccupy their old locations. Can this be used, say, <laughs> for example, George, one time you and I were in, in getting involved in an activity about black people in the United States, Af African Americans, yes. wanting to go back to Africa. And would they be able to identify their tribe and their their roots, yes. literally? Sure. Yes, more and more every day. That's one of the specialized testing. Yes, that with you can a couple provisos. There is a way of tracing the exclusively male line and a way of tracing the exclusively female line, oh, really? but not crossovers. 
your paternal grandmother will drop out of these studies which tend to be either along the mother's 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 mother or father's 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 father and in between not so that up to 25 percent of African Americans um, are unable to identify their tribal origins because they're DNA, part of the because mixed of line. crossovers because of crossovers yeah. of the various tribes even well Europeans no, mother, coming here. Well, Europeans primarily. You may be completely European along your direct male line, completely European along your direct female line, but African American somewhere in the middle, and the testing won't show that up. Mm. You know, there's a lot more about this stuff that us <laughs> common folks don't <laughs> understand. Yeah. And this explains some of that. Yes. Oh, yeah, oh, it yeah. does. Yeah. <clears throat> George, you handed me this the Tsunami Relief Mission Probe and the United States Service Command of America. And I'd like you to tell us just a little bit more about what the USSC, United States Service yes. Command, is. As I said earlier, the United States Service Command is a disaster relief organization. And there was formed 15 years ago by a group of pilots, <coughs> Air Force pilots, who were too old to fly anymore as pilots for the Air Force or the Navy. Marine Corps and so on, so they uh, decided that they would continue serving in this capacity around the world by flying humanitarian people like Colleen and Andy and myself to places at, as needed. And so this was the purpose of forming this group, uh, to bring these pilots. Since then, we've taken a lot of medical personnel and a host of others as well. If someone is interested in contacting the group, they can phone me. My yes. phone number will appear. Yes. And then I can refer. Yes. All right. I want to thank you for being our guests today on Adventures in Life. And I want to thank our viewers for joining us also. And please join us soon again for more Adventures in Life. Thank you, Earl. Thanks, Earl. Thank you. It's been an adventure. <laughs> yeah. It was. It's great. You want to get those